Fantastic. Thank you to our panelists for joining us in the pre-record and now they're joining us live. So it's great to have uh, all of you with us. Um, if you do have any questions uh, that you'd like to ask our panel, please put them in the Q&A feed uh, and we'll get to those in a moment. But I would like to start off by opening the floor and finding out a little bit about the university experience of each of our panelists. Uh, it's been a bit of a theme today with some of the other sessions that have been going on. Um, so I want to start off by asking, what has been something that unexpected uh, that you've done at university uh, during your time? Anyone like to kick us off? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Awesome, Mark, uh, take it away. Yeah, so one thing I really noticed, uh, like in your first week at ANU, you have market day, um, and that exposes you to a whole wide range of clubs and societies that you can join. And for me coming to uni, I used to play saxophone, so I was really keen to get involved um, with music where I could. And in my first year, uh, I was lucky enough to be a part of the big night out at uni, or which is like a battle of the bands between different uh, colleges on campus. And so I think that was a really great part for me because I wasn't doing a music degree, but I still enjoyed that. So it was great to be able to sort of get that involved. Fantastic. Who wants to share their next unexpected experience of studying at uni? Um, I'll share. Um, so I lived, um, so I lived at uh, Bruce Hall, one of the um, residential halls at ANU. And um, I think that pretty much just defined my entire social life. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's very different when you're living with your best friends, when you're sort of around them all the time. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, as Michael alluded to, sort of intercollegiate events like um, Big Night Out. And um, so two, two of the things I got involved were, uh, were um, Bruce Hall, the Bruce Hall play, which we put on each year, and then also um, an event called um, 40 Hours of Film, which is um, a competition where um, each uh, college is given a set of prompts to produce uh, a short film within 40 hours. And then there's like a big screening event and um, it goes towards the Interhall Arts Shield. Um, and so that was just a random thing that I picked up on a whim and really enjoyed. Um, and I think college life is really full of that. Just random things that you can just choose to do on a whim that end up being a lot of fun. Definitely sounds like from Michael and Matt there that those on a whim experiences have been quite enjoyable. Lauren and Sasha, have you had a similar experience with on the whim participation outside of the core study that you've done? Yeah, definitely. Um, I had a similar experience to Matt with um, college life. I was at Fenner Hall. Um, I somehow got in charge of making the set for the play um, with $50. So I was um, going through cardboard recycling bins and then cans of spray paint to sort of create three different moods um, for the play. But that's definitely something that I was not qualified to do, but very enjoyable. <laughs> Fantastic. And Lauren, your thoughts? Yeah, I can jump in. I think I'm the odd one out in that I didn't go to college. Um, well, I didn't reside on college, rather. Um, I, as I came in just for my postgrad, I'd done my undergrad elsewhere. I was living off campus from the get-go. In saying that, there is a similarity in the thing that surprised me most was the like sense of community within my school. So not just amongst the undergraduate students, but the postgraduate students and even the academics. So even as a new postgrad student who hadn't gone to the ANU, um, there's a lot of collegiality within the research school of physics, which is where I'm at. Um, and people are super welcoming there to an absolute newcomer, even like myself, um, and they're interested in you and you can be interested in them. You can get a lab tour just by being interested and learn a lot about what's going on around the school and the social events that we have there too. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, keeping along this, uh, you know, starting breaking the waters with the university experience, if you've got any questions about what it's like to study science at ANU, and we're going to dive in a little bit more about Mary Sam in a moment, but the other university experience question I have for our panel um, is what has been the biggest challenge uh, about 
studying at a university. Now, while you're thinking about that, I'm going to add in my little anecdote about random university experiences to give you about 20 seconds to think. And that is the Lettuce Appreciation Society. It's an ANU society that's been around for a few years now. Uh, it's my absolute favourite definition of all of the random things you can do at ANU rolled into one. The way that the Lettuce Appreciation Society works is they vote for their president based upon who can eat an iceberg lettuce the fastest. Um, and it's just one of those fun social things where you still get the experience of engaging with people about a single topic. Um, and it can be people from all different disciplines. So it's not just, you know, people that are studying science or arts all gathering together. Uh, and I think we've seen that echoed with getting involved with Big Night Out. You've got musicians and definitely not musicians um, all gathered together for that one aspect. All righty, now you've had some thinking time. Biggest challenge about studying at uni? Um, so I think in, uh, in my case, it's the adaptation from um, the sort of high school vibe of being very catered for academically and having people kind of almost breathing down your neck, making sure, you know, you're making progress and okay to a sort of more independent style of studying to being self-guided, not only um, within um, the individual courses themselves and sort of being in charge of your own deadlines and your own progress and, you know, being expected to learn like an adult, but also um, I think in terms of long-term planning, being able to sort of choose your own majors and courses and figure out where you want to do internships and things like that. It's really that sort of self-organization planning that I think was one of the bigger challenges for me. And I, I think this is a very common thread. Um, with that being said, um, I did feel quite supported. Again, living in college with sort of older students who had, you know, been through this process, done the first year courses. It was always easy to, you know, at weird hours of the evening, just knock on someone's door and get some help. Or then there are things like peer assisted learning, um, which is run um, for some of the ANU science courses, um, where you have sort of older student mentors who um, have been really chosen for their proficiency in providing that kind of support. Um, but I think it was quite a process of sort of personal growth and adapting to being independent. Mm, really great thoughts there. And thank you for answering my follow-up question, which is what supports have you used to overcome this challenge? Uh, so now everyone knows what the, uh, the follow-up question is. If you've got any questions uh, for our great panelists of people that have studied at the ANU and also been involved in the Maryson project, chuck them in the Q&A function. Uh, Sasha, I'm going to volunteer you that you're going next to share your challenge. Um, definitely, yeah, similar sort of thing, sort of time management. Um, it's very tricky when no one's sort of telling you to go to class. Like, you sort of have to decide to go to class by yourself instead of the bell going off and that being the place that everyone's going, so you go along to it as well. Um, and, yeah, the self-organisation and deciding stuff <laughs> it's just um, a lot more independent, I guess. Um, but yeah, the sort of community support and that really helped. And um, there are people who will lend a hand and will sort of guide you along the way. So don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions. Yeah, Fantastic. completely what? weird. Completely sorry. With right. <laughs> sorry, Tim. <laughs> Completely with Sasha and Matt about that whole um, managing yourself. And I think that's enhanced when you're doing a research project or uh, the research part of your degree, say in honours, or if you move on to master's or PhD, all of that is just enhanced because you've gone from this um, even though there's no one breathing down your neck, you still have structure. You have, you might have assignments every week or every fortnight, and then you've got an exam. And so you're continually doing these things that somebody's going to check up on. Um, when you get to honors or even say a summer research project that might go for three months or honors, which will go six to eight months. Now, like that deadline, that one thing that you have to do is right at the end of that time. And it can be really hard to adjust to that different pace of doing your work. Um, and especially that self-management that like, well, you know, nobody's really going to notice if I only do two hours today instead of five or six. Um, so adjusting to that and like learning how to pace yourself so you don't have to do this sprint right at the end 
is um, the thing that I found the most challenging. Um, and tied in with that, I'm just going to add a second one, <laughs> is with research projects as well, there's not necessarily an answer. Um, and that's a really big shift to get used to. Um, even in your undergraduate courses, often there's an answer to an assignment. Um, research, you, you know, there's probably an answer, but you don't know what it is. And maybe no one in the world knows what that is. And that's not something that you really encounter until you do these research projects. Um, and yeah, the way to get through that is to, as Sasha and Matt have both mentioned, to like maybe lean on the experience of others a little bit, especially in that really like uncertain time of, you know, not knowing the answer or not knowing if you're heading in the right direction of an answer, looking to the research experience of others who can maybe have a bit more of a, um, I don't like using the word intuition, but they've got more experience in kind of being able to know if you're on the right track or not. Fantastic. Thank you for, for sharing such in depth there and moving us away from just chatting about time management, but I know that's a big challenge for, for students out there transitioning. Um, and I think uh, I echo the sentiment that's been shared um, those that have volunteered for Mary Sam, so contributed their time uh, to create educational resources to pass on to year 11 and 12 students, do so in their own time. Uh, and it, so it's part of uh, managing not only your study, but all of the extra things that you want to contribute to. So thank you for all those tips. Michael, any different challenges or a very similar challenge theme for you? No, it was a bit different for me. Um, so for me coming to uni, I came from uh, town in Tasmania, so coming to uni was a big change for me. I went from being a big fish in a small pond to a small fish in a very big pond. And so for me, it was more of figuring out where I fit in and kind of feeling, oh, am I a bit of an imposter? Do I deserve to be here? There are so many smart people around here. You know, uh, is it okay that I'm here? You know, a bit of that imposter syndrome. And what helped me overcome that was sort of talking to people and realizing, oh, you know, everyone, not everyone knows the answers to everything, even though it may seem that way. And just really understanding that you're all in this together, you're all in the same boat, you're all learning, that's why you're at university. And once you get into that mentality, it's kind of good to be the dumb one in the room because you've got so many experts and smart people around you who you can ask questions from and you can learn so much from them. So I think that was it for me. It was shifting that mentality that it's okay to not know all the answers. It's okay to feel out of place and to really make the most of the knowledge and expertise around you. Thank you, Michael. Some really good tips there. All right, I want to trans transition the conversation and focus, focus it in on science. Uh, so the, the question that I have for you all now, and I'm hoping this uh, gets a little bit of potential uh, tension or back and forth between you all, so please feel free to jump in over the top of each other here. But you're all from slightly different fields of science, you've studied different things or worked in research in different areas, Sasha in chemistry, uh, Lauren in um, nuclear physics, Matt in more of the, the mind messing physics, uh, and Michael across so many other dis uh, like mixed disciplines and tying that all together. So are there any common misconceptions uh, with your area of study or expertise uh, that you'd be interested in getting across to, to those observing? So many about nuclear physics. Where do I begin? Um, I guess the, the, the basic one is um, that all anything attached to the word nuclear physics is dangerous. Um, that's not true for a lot of reasons. Um, more generally, danger comes from when we don't understand what's going on, when we don't understand the amount of radiation something might have. Um, but nuclear physics is used in things like medicine as well. Um, a lot of um, cancer treatments in particular um, will use nuclear physics. Um, so they'll actually use um, nuclear decays to 
um, attack cancer cells um, because you can target specifically um, a region of the body with a radioisotope and deliver that just to where a, a tumour might be um, and then use this, you know, um, otherwise harmful um, nuclear decay to attack the cells that you want to attack and stop them from reproducing. Um, but it can also be used in um, diagnostics and things like that. Like MRI is um, also known as nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, it's all about um, exciting nuclei in the body in a safe way and then letting them relax down again. Um, and the signal that you can detect when they relax can tell you about the different tissues in the body and the structure um, and can be used to identify abnormalities in the body, for example. So yeah, definitely there's many other things I could talk about as well, but nuclear physics, not just dangerous. Fantastic. Any other misconceptions in the, the fields that you'd like to get off your chest? Um, I guess it's a it's a similar story here. So you know what you described um, my my field of uh, science as being the more mind bending kind of physics. Um, and I think often when I when I tell people that I'm a theoretical physicist, um, their response is immediately to you know picture me as this sort of you know very um, abstract you know Einstein kind of figure coming up with crazy theories about you know time and gravity. And I think something that is maybe becoming a little bit more clear to the the public recently, but still well underway is an understanding of the fact that um, theoretical physics is actually a really great avenue to new technologies. Um, and it has been, um, you know, essentially for the entire existence of physics. So some of the greatest innovations of the 20th century, things like um, semiconductors and transistors that are, you know, powering the devices we're using right now to have this conversation, um, they come out of uh, weakly correlated quantum systems. And so now some of the research that we're pushing now in more strongly correlated quantum systems could put, um, could power more interesting innovations in terms of quantum computing for things like understanding exotic materials and, you know, designing medication and drugs. And, um, and things like precision sensing, et cetera. And I think um, the one thing I'd really like to get across is that um, theoretical physics, quantum physics can be really useful and practical. And I think some of the most exciting technologies that we'll see come out in our lifetimes will be powered by that. Um, and again, uh, coming back to um, Lauren, nuclear physics is underpinned by um, quantum mechanics and these principles and a, a better understanding um, of uh, the fundamentals of quantum mechanics can help nuclear physics as well. Yeah, um, so I studied chemistry and I guess chemistry isn't just hexagons. Um, I know sort of <laughs> And memorizing the periodic table, there's a lot more to it. Um, I sort of focused in on materials chemistry, which was very much sort of um, how things respond. Um, and a lot of fun can be had in that area. Um, so don't be, um, what would you call it, disheartened if you have not memorized the periodic table. Because it is, I have not, no one really does. You're always good in exams. Um, don't stress. <laughs> Lauren just couldn't control herself there. Have you had any experience with this? <laughs> um, it's a similar... The, the, um, nuclear physicists have not just the periodic table to look at, but the chart of the nucleides, um, where you have thousands of isotopes. Nobody memorises that either, so it's okay. You always... Every researcher has it pinned on their walls, so <laughs> that's the thing to look at and thing to remember. Uh, this is what I love about the different sciences. Uh, my background is astrophysics. And in astrophysics, you, the periodic table is hydrogen, helium, and the rest are metals. We don't worry about those for the moment. Uh, they're in such small quantities across the world, uh, across the universe that we just don't worry about those when we do calculations. Michael, any misconceptions that you'd like to communicate about all of the cool things that you've learned? Yeah, sure. One that... I think some people have about all of science, but perhaps in particular maths, is that it's very isolating and that you're just sitting in a room by yourself, nutting out a problem, and you don't really see or talk to anyone else. And that's definitely not the case. It's very social. Um, a lot of your best ideas come when you're just chatting with someone about something completely unrelated. 
and then you know they bring up something and then you're like oh i haven't heard of that and you go look it up and you just talk about it more so i think getting across that science is a very collaborative and very social and you meet lots of people from all different backgrounds and with all different experiences and i think yeah that social aspect you know you're not by yourself in this you're in it together yeah i um i strongly agree with that so um I think a lot of the most interesting collaborative papers that kind of like fuse different areas of science always seem to start over like a, you know, coffee or a water cooler or a beer or something. And um, so last year when I was working um, on my honors project, um, Michael, I actually remember um, asking uh, you and some of the um, quantum chemists and nuclear physicists for advice on certain types of computational techniques, um, which I then found very helpful because um, again, it's an exchange of knowledge. So let's chat about that exchange of knowledge. If you've got any questions for our panelists, please put them in the Q&A function. They've had a wide range of experience that we've spoken about. I'd like to focus the conversation on Mary Sem now uh, and the contributions that each of you have made because you've made them in very different ways. Uh, so as a bit more background on Mary Sem, we create educational resources for year 11 and 12 science to help science students and teachers have more time for the fun practical experiences and all the, the fun lab experiences because your first introduction to a concept is in a video format. Uh, so we might do a quick rip around and find out what have you contributed to the, the Mary Sem project and have there been any exciting learnings during that time? Lauren, I might get you to go first. Sure. I made some videos for the chemistry, um, the unit two module, I believe, <laughs> of chemistry um, for Mary Stem. And uh, the thing I learned in that is that editing a video takes way, way longer than creating the content for a video. Um, you can talk and sketch things up um, in quick time, but um, then to actually like edit it all together and make it look nice and communicate your concept clearly is a whole other challenge. Thank you. Communicating that concept clearly uh, is a really interesting thing uh, for, for researchers. Most of the time, I understand, you know, you're writing long form papers, uh, but during your PhD studies, are you also communicating your science not only to your you know, fellow researchers, but also the general public? And are there you know, things that you've learned from Mary Stem that help you in that? Lauren? Yeah, uh, yeah definitely. I think having, um, when you're putting a presentation together, um, whether that's a, a spoken presentation or uh, whether you're writing something, having a clear idea of um, the big picture as well as the the um, narrower bit of work that you're doing is really important. Communicating how what you're doing is uh, relevant to a wider context, like across the world, for example, um, is I think the best and most effective way to communicate your science. Fantastic. And Sasha, you've had a similar experience. You have created uh, videos for Mary Stem, uh, but that was actually through a like for course credit. Can you tell us about that and any cool learnings? Yeah, so um, my minor was in science communication. Um, so with that, I got to do an internship with Mary Stem. Um, got to hang out in the offices for a month or so, um, and yeah, got to learn about um, sort of how Mary Stem works more broadly, as well as creating um, some chemistry content. Um, editing, yeah, it does take a lot of time. <laughs> um, but also the, the flipped um, classroom whole thing is just really amazing. And I wish that my high school did it because um, it is um, just leaves more time for the fun stuff, really, in class. Thanks, Sasha. And thanks for mentioning that, uh, you know, uh, research eve teachery term, which is flipped classrooms. So for background, for those uh, playing along at home, a flipped classroom is where you're introduced to the concept first at home. So it might be a video, you might be asked to read something, then you come to class with your initial questions. 
And it's something that all of undergraduate physics at the ANU is now based upon. Uh, you won't have any lectures in undergraduate physics. You will be watching videos and doing learning and then coming to tutorials. And that's across the whole of a, uh, ANU science. It's spreading now across those areas. So it's something to be aware of in terms of you know, getting prepared and that time management piece that we mentioned earlier. Michael, you also had uh, received some course credit, I believe, for your Mary, Mary STEM contributions. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So I um, also did kind of an internship with Mary STEM over the winter. I did a, I think it was a month or two uh, project and I developed teacher resources. So this was early on with Mary STEM chemistry and I was coming up with uh, worksheets and assessment items and lesson plans uh, so that teachers have those resources available and not sort of given a whole bunch of videos and they're like oh what do I do with these how do I put them together how do I um, assess that you know students have actually watched them and I think the takeaway I got from that was you coming up with a good question is hard because you want to keep it succinct and simple but you also want it to challenge people and challenge what they think they know it's like are they really do they really know that and you also want to include you know the real world in that as much as you can but the real world's really messy and so it's trying to get a simple case scenario out of that real world and give to students so they can get excited about oh wow this is what science actually does but in a way that they can understand, but that also ties into the curriculum. Exactly right there. And like, we really need to emphasize that uh, everyone has contributed to Mary STEM, the students, so ANU students, uh, ANU academics, professional staff. Uh, and the reason why the Mary STEM project exists is about communicating that science in different ways and supporting those different tiers of students that have engaged. Um, the reason for, for having Matt involved in this is Matt hasn't been in front of the camera and hasn't got course credit for his contributions to Mary STEM. But he's still been able to, to give uh, back into the Mary STEM community. Uh, so Matt, can you just quickly take us through in the next 60 seconds uh, what, what you've contributed to Mary STEM and any learnings? Yeah, so um, I think out of everyone on the panel, I've probably done um, the least for Mary STEM. Uh, but I think that's actually an interesting perspective. So. Um, I've sort of uh, participated in um, sort of smaller jobs, things like captioning videos and providing sort of um, feedback on individual pieces. Um, and I think the, the key lesson from that is just how keen a lot of people are here to get involved. Um, just the sheer numbers of people that were rallied at um, these volunteer um, evenings to caption videos and sort of put in, you know, the, this real like hour of power towards, um, you know, producing this content. Um, I think that's the key takeaway that I'd emphasize. Thanks, Matt. It's really you know, great in the ANU community. We have such an interest in contributing and gaining skills. And that's one of the, the goals that I've hopefully been able to communicate uh, with this webinar is that um, in when you're studying science or interested in the science disciplines, you're going to learn a whole range of things. But it's about communicating it to different audiences and developing those skills is important. And then also the volunteering aspects uh, and the, the skills that you gain through that, uh, which is really important. Uh, we are now approaching the final two minutes or so of the webinar. So I want to give a massive thank you to Michael, Lauren, Matt and Sasha for participating in our conversation. Um, thank you all for, for listening along as well and for Jay for moderating. Uh, if you would like to learn more about the Maryson project and gain access to our study resources, if you're a teacher that wants to use them in your classroom or a student who wants to learn from hopefully your fellow uh, future ANU students, your future lecturers, PhD researchers, for example, or alumni, uh, please get in contact. Just type Marystem ANU into Google or marystem.anu.edu.au will also send you to that page. If you've got any questions for our panelists that you haven't had an opportunity to ask, please use our website to get in contact with us. Uh, we'll definitely pass on those questions and start a relationship with, uh, between our panelists and yourself with any questions that you've got. Uh, so 
Panelists, thanks so much for, for coming along. Um, audience, thank you for participating. It's been great to have you. I hope you all have a great rest of the ANU Virtual Open Week. Uh, so shall we give a big wave send off? See you later, everyone.